Well, sadly, the planet is uh, still warming. Uh, the Earth is already about one degree Celsius warmer than it should be, and it's getting warmer all the time. And as the planet warms, we're destabilizing weather patterns, um, patterns of rainfall and drought, where the ice can be and snow, things like this. And this is just the beginning of what could happen unless we begin to curb greenhouse gas emissions very, very quickly. Unfortunately, we've waited too long uh, to take gradual action. We wasted basically 30 years while scientists were warning us about climate change. We didn't act quickly enough. And now we have a very narrow window of opportunity to really get serious about climate change and prevent some of the worst damages that are yet to come. Yeah, so I work at an organization called Project Drawdown, or drawdown.org, and we're the world's kind of leading resource for climate solutions. Um, there are lots of organizations talking about the climate problems of how bad it is and what's going to happen to the weather and climate, but we're about solutions uh, around energy and food and um, agriculture and forestry and materials. And so we research the different kinds of solutions that are out there in the world, and we share them with everyone on a kind of a neutral scientific way. Uh, the word drawdown refers to the moment in the future when we start to draw down the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Right now, they're climbing up and up and up. Um, but what we want to do is kind of bend the curve and bring it back down again. And that's the moment we stop climate change is the moment we start bending the curve on greenhouse gases. Well, I, th I think we have some very well-meaning people in the technology industry, people like Bill Gates, Elon Musk, and others, who I, oh, I appreciate their enthusiasm and their resources and their talent helping with this problem. But I worry that they're uh, too enamored with technologies that are not here now, but rather will come in the future. What we don't have is time to waste. We've already wasted too much time. Uh, waiting for the policies to get better, waiting for money to come around, for technology to get better. And uh, time is not our friend. So um, I would argue that we have to use tools we have right now, right here today, and get started. Don't wait another second to start working on climate change. That is dangerous. Uh, of course, if new technologies do become available, we can add them to our work as we go along. That would be fine but it would be very, very dangerous to wait. Um, and Bill Gates seems to advocate like, no, it's better to invest in future technologies than to act now because then the technologies will be even better. And I think that's folly. Um, I think that we need to use everything we can immediately because look, we, we have to cut the emissions of greenhouse gases basically in half by the end of this decade in only nine years. And um, that's more than the rise of emissions over the last 50 years, we have to cut that in only nine years. I don't think we can wait another month, let alone years and years for some maybe technology to come along. And also um, the track record of new technologies is usually very poor. Uh, most of them never arrive uh, or they're too expensive or they're too late. Just look at nuclear power, look at fusion, the carbon removal, all these things people wanna talk about they never seem to come despite billions and billions of euros being invested. I don't know where they are yet. So I think we have to use what we have now that's proven, which is efficiency, renewables, better diets, changing what we use, better designed cities. Those work now and that now is better than new. Well, Project Drawdown reviews existing solutions. Uh, we also take a look at solutions that may come in the future, but we're in, interested in solutions that are here today. And we've reviewed um, a lot of them, but we've written about maybe around 100 of them that we've actually examined in great detail. So we look at different solutions in electricity, things like uh, solar energy, wind energy, hydro, nuclear, biomass, all those kinds of things as well as energy conservation, which is very, very important. Uh, we look at transportation, we look at buildings, we look at industry, we look at agriculture and land use and forestry. And these are all the sectors that are emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And we ask, how can we cut those and bring them down to zero? 
In addition, though, nature is removing some of our greenhouse gases right now in things like forest and in the oceans, absorbing carbon dioxide in what are called carbon sinks. And so we look at how we can help nature preserve those sinks and maybe even add to them a little bit and help remove kind of naturally some of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So Project Drawdown looks across you know, dozens and dozens of solutions and asks how can we cut emissions basically to zero as quickly as possible and work with nature to preserve carbon sinks. So um, if you will, we look at the sources of greenhouse gases and the so-called sinks and work on both sides of that equation. And, uh, but we, we review the economic and technical potential of each of these solutions by looking at you know, all the available evidence, uh, and we're very neutral. Uh, we don't have any financial or political um, agenda here. We just wanted to get the science right, but then share that with the world so that governments and businesses and communities and investors and technologists and everyone can really learn what are the most effective solutions. What we find is um, if we use all 100 solutions that we've looked at, we barely now have enough to stop climate change. We can actually do it uh, with the solutions we have today, but we need almost 100 of them to do it. All of them are needed. Um, and each one is doing a little piece of the puzzle, which is great. And together they can stop climate change and create jobs, um, bring more money back into our economy and be really, really good for the planet. But we have to get started now. Well, I, some solutions are happening, uh, which is good news. Uh, things like renewable energy is getting cheaper. Electric cars are becoming more common. Uh, we are seeing some good things happening in a few areas. Um, but the power dynamics are all wrong. Um, there are still a lot of very powerful interest making a lot of money and a lot of power out of the fossil fuel industry or out of uh, industrial agriculture that can be very destructive or deforesting the Amazon in Indonesia. These are extremely powerful, very wealthy groups that don't want to change. And so they're distorting the political conversations within most of our countries, especially mine and maybe yours too a little bit. Um, and also at the, at the international level um, where we try to negotiate these things. It's hard to negotiate um, a meaningful cooperative agreement when some people don't want to change because they're getting rich off of destroying the planet. And um, that's just the matter of fact of it. And our politics are having a very hard time overcoming that. Um, we eventually will, I think, um, as businesses and others realize it's not in anyone's interest to destabilize our climate. But right now there are too many very powerful interests, especially the fossil fuel industry, um, who have everything to gain by continuing to burn coal, oil, and gas. And we, the rest of the world, have everything to lose. Well, it turns out that a lot of things that we should do, not because of climate change, but they're good things for the world, can sometimes have additional benefits to climate change as well. Uh, one of those that you mentioned is empowering women and girls, especially around health care and education access for women and girls around the world, especially in developing countries. Uh, we also find that helping indigenous communities preserve their land and land tenure is also good because uh, the forest that indigenous communities tend to work in are usually more productive and store more carbon and have more biodiversity than their neighbors. But getting back to women and girls, what we find is of course, when um, you, you give more equality and more opportunity to half of the population of the world, amazing things happen. Uh, at first, one of the simple things that happens is changes in the behavior um, of women and girls in developing countries who maybe had children very, very young and a lot of children and many of them weren't very healthy. But by having more access to health care and education, girls and women might have fewer children later in life who are healthier, more likely to survive and allow women and girls to still have economic opportunity. So that changes everything. You see a different path for economic development. You see changes in population growth are a lot lower. You see changes in the resource consumption of those countries. 
that could be better in the long run, uh, especially by having lower emissions in the long run. But the good news is you don't do this because of climate change. It's just the right thing to do. But in addition, seems to foster a landscape where other things like benefiting climate change and other things can happen too. But more importantly, which is harder to quantify, um, the solutions to the problem of climate change are probably not going to come all from the people who helped cause it, which are too many people who look like me, like white men who've been in power for too long. So I think one of the most exciting things is by uh, fostering more equality and more equity around the world, we may kind of generate new ideas and new political uh, forces and new ways of moving the world that we've never seen before. And maybe that will be the key to unlocking some of the best solutions that we don't even know about yet. So um, it could be very exciting. I've seen that same claim made before, and I've actually looked at the numbers, and I'm not as convinced um, because uh, as a share of the, if you think of the number of people in like a U.S. military or all the militaries of the EU, for that matter, or Russia or whatever, there are a lot of people and they move around. And um, it's really not that surprising as a fraction of the of the economy militaries are that their emissions are about comparable. I mean, any small fraction of the United States because it's one of the largest, or China for that matter, would be bigger than a lot of countries because you know, China is 1.4 billion people. Uh, their military is even bigger than emitters than ours probably. So I'm not sure that's really true. Um, I think we like to believe that it is, but I'm not sure that that's actually quite accurate. Um, if all the world's military is probably like no more than one or 2% of global emissions, all of the militaries of the world. And uh, yes, that's bigger than some small countries like you know Finland or something maybe, but um, I'm not that worried about it. Um, I, I think, you know, it, it will be very hard to convince militaries to give up like aviation fuel or tank fuel. I mean, it just it seems like that's going to be one of the last emitting sectors, but it's not something that is um, really that big a deal in some ways. I mean, it sounds like it is, but it's it often isn't. And it's already accounted for in the national emissions numbers. We know, like when we count the emissions from the US, it includes the US military already. Even if they're overseas, it's reported here. Same with the Chinese, same with the EU, same with Russia. Um, I don't like that fact. I would really like that the militaries would stand down and not use these things. What could be very interesting is if we find that the militaries are an ally in addressing climate change because it might improve the safety and um, of their of the troops uh, of these soldiers, if um, for example, when the American military was in Iraq and Afghanistan, and there were a lot of roadside explosions killing soldiers, a lot of those were because of fuel convoys uh, moving diesel fuel back and forth between a military base and where the fuel was being received. If you don't need to do that because the the troops are using solar power panels or different kinds of batteries or things like that instead of moving diesel fuel. You save lives. So I think actually we can, um, it's kind of a long-winded answer, but I guess I'm saying the, these numbers that were thrown around about how big the military is as a climate change emitter are really overblown. It's a couple of percent at most for the whole world, but it's still important. And I think that maybe we could find win-win opportunities by convincing the world's military leaders not to just go away. I don't think that's realistic. Um, I wish it was, but it probably isn't. So um, rather than wishing that for so, I'd like to work with them to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe we can make your soldiers safer and reduce your emissions and your dependence on fuel convoys, which could be very, very dangerous in unstable parts of the world by changing the way you do things. And uh, during the Obama administration, um, the U.S. military was doing that. That was all canceled during the Trump years, of course. But maybe now we can get back to that idea of making the U.S. military, for example, much more efficient. But we'd have to do you know, the same thing needs to be done with the Russians and the Chinese and the various EU militaries, NATO, everybody. Uh, they're all doing this. So um, it's something to look at for sure. But it's uh, all told the militaries of the world are just a couple percent, um, which is about their share of the global economy.
Well, we have to first recognize that we are part of the system. So when people talk about systemic change, we're part of those systems. Systems don't just change at the top. Um, so when we change our individual behavior, it still matters. Maybe not materially, like just you and I changing our homes isn't going to change the atmosphere very much. But it sends a political signal. It sends an economic signal. It sends a social signal, which is even more powerful than our votes in some ways. But do that, too. Um, so I would say our individual actions first are by voting, by talking about climate change, by participating in our democracies, and making sure this is always a priority, not just with elected officials, but with the businesses we engage, with the communities we engage, our friends, our neighbors, all of that talking about climate change is by far the most important thing we can do. Uh, but then in terms of our day-to-day -day life, um, some of the best things I would argue are things that probably save you money and make you healthier too. Uh, like, by, you know, maybe finding ways to walk to work and or to bicycle when we can all eventually go back to work. Um, when we uh, maybe eat different diets that are like less um, full of red meat, for example, and maybe more full of plants uh, would be better. Maybe not 100 percent, but whatever you can would be helpful. Uh, food waste is a really big deal. It turns out 30 to 40 percent of all the food in the world, not just rich countries, is lost. And uh, that's terrible because that means 30 to 40 percent of all the land and water and climate impacts of agriculture weren't even necessary. That's incredible. So maybe we can dial down on food waste. Uh, other things, of course, when you have the opportunity within your home or apartment uh, to replace an old appliance that dies, like a, a refrigerator, um, the light bulbs in your house, when those break and you need to replace them, get the most energy efficient ones you can, of course. And um, so I think it's in these major categories like food, transportation, uh, heating and cooling your home, uh, electricity use in your home, doing things that make your life a little more efficient and save you money, but also maybe give you a healthier diet and a little more exercise. What's not to like? But um, I think doing that is good. Um, but talking about climate change and voting with climate change in mind and all kind of participating in the larger society is really part of what we all need to do to address this as part of a larger system. We, we you know, our individual actions do matter. That's why we have democracies. And uh, hopefully when they work, we can see change happen.